Thank you very much for the introduction, Melissa. Um, hopefully everybody can listen, can, can hear me. Uh, so a little caveat, you know, I'm gonna start sharing my screen in a second. A caveat is in order. Um, my hobby is actually American politics and I actually don't teach American politics as, as Melissa noted, most of my work is in international relations. However, I do work on, on, on social media and public opinion and I apply that mostly to events like terrorism, um, to study the United Nations, to study crowdsourcing techniques in social media and, and the way that we use uh, that kind of tactic to study responses to natural disasters. I am from Puerto Rico, so I have been studying the recovery of, um, of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And that has been my, 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 current, my current research for the last two years. However, um, I have been become very, very um, interested in, in a big question is whether social media can help us uh, with, you know, um, to understand some political events like elections. I decided to retool some of my talking points for the purposes of the current political climate. We have an election, of course, um, in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and decided to start using some of the this presentation to actually share some ideas, some thoughts with you guys to understand how social media may be able to explain the election that is forthcoming and to understand the past election, which was of course very controversial. Um, and I think social media is nothing new. Uh, here is a number of studies that, you know, that have actually, you know, saw different aspects of how social media interacts, you know, with, with politics and as well as economic and social issues. Uh, I think, you know, Airline industries were one of the few, the few, the first companies that started to really mine their Twitter audiences to make sure that they were delivering uh, a very good customer service experience. Uh, so I've always, you know, noted that if you have a bad, you know, day uh, in an airline, you should tweet about it. Chances are you'll get a tweet back within a couple of hours, trying to explain, trying to get more information on what actually took place, because they're really trying to make sure that people are happy with you know um with with your experiences if you look at you know the work of bowling mount and Seng, they use twitter data to try to understand uh the stock market's performance back in 2010. Um, another set of researchers you know started looking at uh, the 2008 presidential election and they used the consumer uh, confidence survey as well as twitter data to try to explain uh, or try to predict you know um, obama's you know victory in 08 Mac Williams, you know, uh, use you know Facebook data to to explain the outcomes of the 2014 U.S. midterm elections, and then Standard Val, Valle, Eels, Baldino, and Borja predicted the Leaps campaign electoral trends using Facebook data a few, a few days before the Brexit referendum, and we'll use you know we'll talk more about the Standard et al. article uh, a little bit later, uh, given that you know it's it's kind of the the the, the one that actually started to lead me. Uh, down this path, you know, uh, research path. So let me, before we enter into a little bit of the social media, let's just cover a couple of basics. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly is what I like to call it. The first thing, of course, is that, you know, uh, there are many, many individuals right now active in, in multiple social media platforms. The Pew Research uh, Center estimates that uh, around 72% of American adults have at least one social media account, and that's actually quite, quite, quite high. Um, the bad, of course, you know, is that there is, um, there is, of course, you know, um, issues, you know, um, that there's issues regarding the quality of the data. So not all, you know, social media data is actually quite good. It's very difficult to actually follow some trends in the data. Uh, for some, for, for instance, when you're doing textual analysis, uh, the computer doesn't understand what sarcasm is. So the data in that sense, you know, can be spotty. Uh, putting together a, a, a representative sample is very, very difficult. Social media does not reflect uh, the complete adult population. There's many adults who are not in social media and that are politically active. So it's important to understand that one doesn't uh, substitute the other. Uh, accessing the, the, the data in the social media platform is not always easy. And it's become a lot more difficult, especially with Facebook data. And of course the ugly side, of the equation is that there's a lot of legal questions about who owns the data and what information is private and what is public. Uh, when people um, post, you know, information about their views and opinions, 
they may actually do so thinking that they're in a private forum, but their their settings may be ones that they're sharing with the rest of the public. Should I, as a researcher, you know, uh, use you know their data uh, without their consent? That's the ethical question here, and that is something that we have not actually been able to figure out completely. And I believe you know that those are some of the questions that researchers are trying to address go forward. In my case, you know, when I use you know um, social media data, I anonymize the data, so we don't have to worry about you know trying to um, represent people's views uh, out in the open. Uh, the the important part here, of course, is that you know that that traditional survey methodologies are not as predictive as they used to be, and it's mostly because people are not really answering their phones or completing the surveys. So there has been questions about trying to beef up uh, our, you know, our surveys and public opinion um, methodologies with, you know, social media analysis. And in many ways, you know, many corporations have actually now used different techniques to try to gauge, you know, public opinion. And one of the measures that they're using is public opinion data. Ipsos actually uh, does, you know, look at Twitter trends uh, in order to be able to, to understand, you know, how people feel about different events. Uh, individuals engaged in the multiple social uh, media platforms could help us contextualize people's opinions in a particular point of time. And I think it's important that we emphasize that it's a particular point of time. And of course, you know, for me as a researcher, I think when I mine social media, I'm always thinking about trying to test uh, a lot of hypotheses, you know, in the social sciences that have been always with us, uh, but that have been difficult to answer for whatever reason. And I'm not using a case study today on, on, on the reconstruction of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, but I do have one on crowdsourcing uh, that is, there's a long-standing hypothesis on crowdsourcing that I actually show how people's knowledge in Puerto Rico about, about the hurricane's damage actually, you know, fulfills, you know, or, or proves that, that hypothesis. I'm not going to get into that today. I decided to keep it all, you know, with, with, with the American politics in, in, in mind. Um, so, of course, you know, one of the things that I, I assume is that, you know, campaigns, you know, are trying to grow their, their followings. And the question is why? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, many, many Americans uh, have at least, you know, one uh, social media account. The king of social media in the United States is Facebook. Uh, right now, se almost 72% of, of Americans have at least one social media account. And that is actually quite, quite, quite impressive. And if you can see right here in this graph, you can see that in 2005, the numbers were closer to 9% and they have crested up to 72% uh, in, 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 since then. And that's, you know, quite a bit of a growth. Um, as noted before, you know, Facebook is a king of social media. 69% of, of American adults are right now in Facebook and they use it on a, on a, on a, at least on a, on a daily basis. Instagram, you know, has surpassed Twitter uh, with 37% and then Twitter is a smaller platform uh, with 22% adult Americans uh, actively participating in, in, the, in the microblogging uh, site. One question that I often, you know, tell my students is to, you know, to try to explain to me why political personalities and, camp and, can and candidates and campaigns are, are in, in social media. And this could apply to the Secretary General of the United States too, or to presidents or prime ministers. And the answer, of course, is that, you know, it's a way to by bypass the news media scru scrutiny. Uh, in the past, you know, in order for a candidate or a politician to make a statement, they really needed to either go in person and meet with people, or they had to rely on the media to spread their message. Uh, today, you know, thanks to social media, people, candidates and, and politicians and, and campaigns can talk directly with their, with, with their constituents. And that is, of course, you know, both good and bad. It's, put in the, it's bad in the sense that, you know, the media doesn't play now gatekeeper of information and make sure that the information is, is credible and accurate. But at the same time, you know, uh, it's good that, you know, today politicians can have um, connections to their constituents and they can actually get real time feedback from them as well on what they're thinking about different, different issues. So, um, so that's uh, an important, you know, reason altogether. The rules of political advertising 
in social media are also very different through the ones that regulate advertising on television and radio. And I think it's important that we remember that. So a lot of campaigns, you know, will put some of the more controversial ads um, in social media because they don't have to worry about the regulations. And of course, you know, we know this from the from from attempts, you know, to interfere in the election of 2016. You can have, you know, um, actors, you know, post controversial statements that can derail a campaign's message or spread misinformation. And that's one of the problems that right now Twitter, uh, Facebook, and and so forth are trying to address is that they're trying to actually uh, make sure that their networks are not being used by other actors to, to spread misinformation or to try to corrupt our electoral process. Um, when you see, you know, uh, the campaigns nowadays, you, every, you know, most campaigns have digital operations uh, and the reason that they have them is really, you know, to support fundraising activities. Uh, I don't know if you have been following Joe Biden or, or Donald Trump's Social media, I do, of course, for, uh, for, for, for research perspectives. And I get so many emails and so many messages and so many ads from both sides to, to support and to and, uh, their, their fundraising activities. It, it, it's quite amazing, actually. Uh, they can also do so to announce campaign events, especially rallies. Back in the pre-COVID day, this was something that the Bernie Sanders did really, really well. Um, and also, you know, Donald Trump, they used, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter especially Facebook, to announce events and to actually get people to sign up for tickets and so forth. And of course, you know, uh, there's some research to show that people that are actively engaged in social media tend to actually go out and uh, go out and vote. And it's because they're being targeted to actually or reminded that they should go out and vote by the campaigns. The better political campaigns, you know, tend to use, you know, tend to actually do what we call A-B testing. Uh, so they will actually take a lot of their messaging and they will actually test it with many, many different types of constituents. And so they can try to measure the effectiveness of those messages. So for instance, if a campaign, you know, uh, is trying to figure out what words or phrases, you know, work, they may send, you know, um, they may actually target via Facebook one particular group of people using certain words and then change the message around with other words, but, you know, trying to imply the same idea to see which one gets better reaction. And then based on that, they will actually use the one that has higher engagement than the one that had lower engagement. The Trump campaign did this, you know, in 2016 quite, quite convincingly, and they would actually be testing ideas, you know, all day until they actually got their message together. Um, also, you know, campaigns are mining their, their networks to learn their supporters' desires. Uh, so, you know, uh, back in 2012, you know, Mitt Romney used to be uh, signing up for all these lists of information, people's magazine, you know, subscriptions, their shopping habits, and so forth, in order to try to get a, an idea of who was a Mitt Romney supporter. And then with that information, they could actually micro-target them. Uh, today in Facebook and in Twitter, uh, and Instagram, but especially Facebook, we're sharing a lot of information about what we like, the movies that we see, the the, the sports that we play, our hobbies, and so forth. So um, campaigns can actually mine that information in order to be able to get an, an, an idea of what people like, what makes them tick, and to more importantly, create, you know, uh, advertising that can be used in order to target them for different, 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 you know, uh, reasons. So that's a, a, another thing that, that political campaigns tend to do uh, quite convincingly. Uh, accessing Facebook data has become very, very difficult, you know, uh, because of the uh, the and uh, the the Cambridge Analytical scandal of 2016. Cambridge Analytica was a firm that helped Donald Trump and also uh, they were involved in the Brexit you know, referendum to try to get information um, on, 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 on the supporters you know, uh, of those campaigns. But Cambridge Analytica did violate you know, some of the Facebook's you know, terms of services and they got in trouble. They were eventually kicked out. The Cambridge Analytica had to close their operations. They have been reopened under a different name right now. Um, but for the most part, you know, uh, Facebook decided to really start tightening up how researchers and outsiders can use the data. So today it's very, very difficult for, 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 for people to, to get the data. It's not impossible. I have colleagues that are using data and there's ways that you can actually, you know, apply for data. But for the most part, you know, it's not as easy as it was in 2016 where I could personally go in, um, 
with my, 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 my special developers app and pull any data that I really wanted. And I could actually even pull the name of the person, um, which would, you know, be used as a proxy to figure out uh, their gender and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, so things are a little more difficult right now, but nevertheless, Facebook is the, the king of social media and the, the benefits are, are, are we started out, you know, important. Like I mentioned before, 69% of Americans are active, you know, Facebook users. In the world, you have 2.7 2 billion people active in, in, in Facebook. Um, Facebook right now tends to favor older people and older people tend to vote at a higher rate than, than younger people. Uh, users have multiple ways to engage uh, in, with the posts and, and we'll talk about that, you know, in a second. And of course, you know, comments are longer than 280 characters. In the types of engagement, as you all know, you know, you can like, comment or share. From the perspective of a campaign, the most important one is to share. Share allows, you know, for a post to actually, you know, widen this, its reach. Commenting is important because, you know, of course, you know, this is how you start mining information. People post something and you can actually start downloading it and then figuring out what you, what you can do. And of course, the easiest way of engaging is to like. And likes, you know, are, are a good currency, but comment and share tend to be ones that campaigns like a little bit better. Uh, in Twitter, engagement is, you know, uh, a little bit, you know, different. But, you know, similar to Facebook, Twitter, of course, you know, is not as popular in the United States as Facebook or Instagram. It, they have 340 million users worldwide. Um, the issue with Twitter is that it's a microblogging site. So uh, people are limited to expressing their ideas in 280 characters. Uh, like in Facebook, Twitter, you know, users can favor a tweet. They can retweet a tweet or they can respond to a tweet. Um, Responding, of course, is, and, and, and retweeting are two important metrics that campaigns like because it helps those tweets go viral. But favorites are important indicators as well, and you will see this in a couple of minutes. So with that covered, let's get into the case studies. And I'm going to talk about Brexit first uh, because Brexit is kind of like, you know, the way that we enter into the 2016 race. And my own research starts because of you know uh, of a, an important paper that I, that I already mentioned and I'll talk about it in a second. But to just re, 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 review uh, or summarize what took place, um, the polls heading into the Brexit vote in Britain had the Remain campaign winning by four 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 percentage points, and of course that did not take place. Actually, you know uh, Brexit passed with fifty two percent of the vote in favor of leaving the European Union and 48%, you know, for remaining in the European Union. And I'm not gonna get into the whole breakdown of the vote and, and all that, we can talk about that in the question and answers if you have questions. But what's important here is that everybody was surprised by the results. And even some of the people that were leading the lead campaign were surprised that they could actually mobilize their supporters and, you know, uh, make that happen. Uh, here's a, different, you know, graph that actually shows moving averages for, uh, for, the, for, for those polls that I mentioned already, the polling average, in my opinion, and not everybody agrees on this, there's a lot of debate on this in political science, but I believe the moving averages are better at capturing uh, trends in politics than just looking at the raw data by itself. What's important here is that you see the purple line, which is for me the undecided voters, and you start noticing that the lead campaign were supposed to actually, you know, win uh, the vote, but as undecided voters started to uh, go down, you can see that there is a slight uptick in both lines. So the undecideds were breaking, you know, not evenly because they didn't break evenly, but they started breaking, you know, more towards the, the, the lead campaign, but it's an important part of the equation. And this of, of, of course also happened in 2016. Uh, there was many, many undecided voters until at least a week before the elections. I mentioned this uh, article by, by Stander, Valle, Eels, Baldino, and Borja uh, before, but these uh, researchers were looking at the numbers a couple of days before the vote, and they started noticing an important pattern that the numbers were not, the polling numbers were not suggesting. And what was, they were noticing was that the lead campaign was definitely, you know, pumping out more information than, than the Remain campaign. But if you look at the number of shares, those, you know, uh, 
posts were actually spreading like wildfires in the internet and that was making a big difference. If you start noticing uh, the questions on comments, no doubt that there were more comments, you know, posted for remain campaign, but the lead campaign uh, also, you know, saw an increase at the end. And more importantly, in the likes, even though that's the easiest way to agree with a post, you see an explosion in the number of, of, of likes. So altogether, from the three uh, from the from the three metrics, you know, that matter, uh, likes, comments, and shares, three of them, two of them were on the side of the of the of the of the of the, of the lead campaign. And researchers, you know, and this all the, all this, you know, um, researchers are statisticians were started to come through the data and saying, wait a minute, there is something going on here that the public opinion data is not capturing, but nevertheless, you know, something that we should pay attention to because there seems to be a lot of support within, you know, at least in Facebook for these perspectives. So we made it very clear and just saw that these numbers were not representative of the of the vote. They were not necessarily, you know, uh, statistically significant, but they were actually alluring that there was something going on uh, in the in, in the dynamics of of of, of the deb of the debate on on Brexit that was not being captured by uh, the news media at the time. If you look at if you take all the comments from the post, you know, for 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 both campaigns, and you actually put them through the computer uh, in order to actually see what the most important words are, these are called word clouds. You can actually start noticing that there's a difference between uh, both, you know, uh, sides. So uh, this was, of course, you know, the Brexit, you know, vote was about, you know, sovereignty issues and Britain, but for people that wanted to stay, it was better. They were doing so because of economic reasons. The fear, of course, is that uh, the Britain outside the EU cannot do as well, economically speaking. However, for the vote and uh, for the lead campaign, uh, sovereignty is, is an important matter and you can see some of the key words are, are, are bigger. So you can say take control back and it's basically to try to take control back over British affairs from, from the European Union. And again, I'm not here to, to actually discuss, you know, which side is better and which one, which one is worse. I have actually given a lot of talks on, on, on this area because I used to teach British politics. I lived in, in London for a long time. I have a lot of friends who work from both sides of the political aisle there. And I have been an observer of, of British politics for a long, long time. But what's important here is that, you know, you have a, a very strong message in both sides. And, you know, for the most part, this area of taking control back, you know, started to resonate a little bit more with the British public than the one about, you know, economic, you know, uh, well-being. So how is this, you know, important, you know, for, for the tw for, to, to understand the 2016 elections? So I was kind of surprised, you know, uh, when I started doing this uh, research, probably like a, a couple of months after Donald Trump won. But if, to remember, Donald Trump, you know, was supposed, you know, to, to lose the election. Uh, most, you know, models, uh, including the 538 model, which was a bully, the, the one that was, you know, more positive about Trump's chances of winning, had Hillary Clinton winning by quite a bit. Uh, that was, of course, not the case. And and what happened, of course, is that, you know, um, Mrs. Clinton lost slim margins in Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania that actually threw the, the election towards, towards Trump. Um, in some cases, you know, 100,000, 80,000 votes uh, was the difference between winning and, and losing and the Electoral College favored Trump in that sense because Mrs. Clinton won with uh, 3 million uh, extra votes um, in, in, the, in that one. But of course, you know, the Electoral College is the way that we decide our, 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 our presidency. And, and I think, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, you're gonna have another speaker in this series, you know, who will be talking about the Electoral College and I invite you guys to come and listen to, to I think it's a him, uh, to speak because it, it's an important issue that, that deserves a lot of attention. Um, so if we can build on the, on the Brexit vote, you know, I decided to use Facebook data to exploit why Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. Um, it is worth noting that I studied two weeks before the elections, the October 21st to November 8th, and that polling data during, during ex and, and, and the exit polls after the 2016 presidential elections confirmed that around 13% of racer voters were undecided and then deciding who to vote for a few, uh, for a few days, be um, to vote for a few days before elections, elections day. 
man, we need a, a coma in that in that one. But what's important here uh, is to to remember that I'm looking for a two-week period, and I am trying to recreate, you know, the, the study that that the, that the researchers in Britain had. And this may be surprising for some, but um, even though you know. Uh, uh, Trump is very, uh, uh, very, you know, active in social media. The Clinton campaign, for the most part, uh, had more posts than than, than Trump overall uh, in, in 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 the cycle. Uh, 181 versus 179. Mrs. Clinton had 7,200 7, 7, thousand followers. Trump had 11 million five hundred. Um, but what's important here is to start looking at the average comments per day. Notice, you know, that Mrs. Clinton's, you know, campaign was generating many comments. That this was where the Trump campaign was seeing a lot of, you know, strengths and energy. Uh, not all the comments that were being placed um, uh, reacting to Trump's posts were positive. But in, in, in this game, what matters is the numbers rather than the content necessarily. Um, if we look at the likes, which is the easiest way to do business, you can see that at the end of the campaign, as it's closing, you see that Trump's likes go up. And then in the last day of campaigning, the ones for Clinton start to, to, to go south. The same applies to average shares per day. Um, Clinton, you know, was of course, you know, doing better in the shares business but by the end of the campaign, it lost steam and Trump started to eke out more shares in the last day. And that, of course, you know, like in the, in the other one, I would say that we have out of the three, we have two metrics that in Trump's favor, the shares per day is at the end of the day ahead, you know, Trump, Trump is ahead, but Mrs. Clinton did achieve some, some important and noteworthy, you know, victories, you know, uh, going forward. So we do work clouds for the messaging for all the posts that you see um, uh, that they were using Facebook for that two week period. You can see some, some important differences. For Donald Trump, you know, uh, MAGA or Make America Great Again, Drain the Swamp is very important. Of course, contribute help, you know, uh, and you can see other things that will make America great again uh, in, many, in many things. But you see that we're Michigan here and you see other, other little tidbits information going forward. Um, Clinton, of course, is mentioned as well in, in, in those ones. Here, you know, we also see in the in the other side of the equation that HillaryClinton.com, like DonaldJTrump.com, you know, is very prevalent, and we start seeing the word "vote" quite quite a, quite bigger than it is in the, in the other side because she's asking people to vote, uh, make a plan. Of course, is also part of the vote technique because there was concerns that people were not going to come out in big numbers. And those concerns, you know, bore out to be real. And for the most part, you know, there is not nothing here that captures, you know, uh, a message. I, you know, I will vote.com, vote. All that is important, but you know, a lot of her messaging didn't come through. You know, even uh, something like saying "I'm with her," which was one of her taglines, does not appear in this um, in this work cloud. But MAGA as well as in the swamp, which were two important taglines for the campaign for Trump, made it, you know, pretty big in the in in the in the in the word frequencies. And again, this by itself should not be, you know, suggesting anything. But many people have 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 argued that Mrs. Clinton did not have a very clear message and that most of her campaign was built on the fact that she felt that people were not gonna vote for Trump because Trump was such an aberration in American politics. And She's not wrong. She won the popular vote. She won. She won the vote by three million votes. But in the end, uh, what the what matters is the electoral college, and there were people in certain states that preferred Trump over Clinton, and that definitely affected uh, her 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 future uh, in, uh, as as you know as politics. In terms of Twitter, what I have decided is to actually, given that it's difficult to find Facebook data nowadays, I decided to recently, and I did this in the summer see if we could use Twitter data to try to corroborate the findings of the of, of what we have with Facebook, uh, which basically, you know, builds upon the research done by the research uh, by the researchers in Britain on Brexit. And Hillary Clinton had, you know, 
over 10 million people following her on Twitter uh, on election day, and Donald Trump had around 13 million. So in this one, there were not, you know, a couple of millions is a big difference, but but it's definitely, you know, closer than, 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 than one would think. And these are some of the top tweets uh, for each candidate uh, in the cycle. The highest one was number five for Trump, which make America great again. It get it got 97, you know, thousand um, favorites, and then a bunch of you know other um, comments. If you see, you know, um, the one that got got the most favorites was the one about um, the Cinco de Mayo, infamous, you know, picture of the Taco Bell at Trump Tower, and that of course that that was one of his. Um, um, pictures that he was trying to show his support for Latino voters. Um, Hillary Clinton, you know, um, had, you know, an important, you know, day which women have the power to stop Trump. And then, and we serve, which is the tagline that she definitely used, got a lot of support within, you know, uh, Twitter. Uh, if we look at the Twitter data, you start noticing that uh, Trump dominated the field um, for the most part on the, on the, on the metric you know, um, on, well, I'm sorry, uh, um, I couldn't see the title. So on this one, we can see that Hillary Clinton posted more uh, in Twitter than, 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 than Donald Trump did, and by a lot. But when it comes to the favorites and the retweets, uh, Donald Trump was just doing a lot better. And he did, he did so, you know, during the whole campaign. Uh, in the average favorites, which is an important measure, the same applies here. Uh, Hillary Clinton's just numbers just were not strong enough, and they, were, they didn't come close to 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 to, to Trump's. If we were to do the work clouds, you can again see a similar pattern. During the swamp, it's much much bigger here. Um, there is you know reference to make America great again in the bottom, and 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 you can see you know things like Michigan, New Hampshire, and, and so forth. You know emails, reference to the emails. But you have, you know, you have a lot of states that she that, that are mentioned here: Colorado, uh, crooked Hillary, Obama, Obamacare fail here. The president tends to be more active in Twitter than he's in Facebook, and and you can start seeing here, you know, a lot of the thought process. Hillary, you know, um, Clinton's, you know, Twitter feed uh, tends to have mostly, you know, tweets that are cured by the campaign. They're not necessarily written by her. The ones that are written by by her had an H at the at the end. Um, we know that most of Trump's tweets were actually shared by him. And that's a big difference. And you start seeing here that you cannot really find a very clear message in, in, her, in, in her work cloud. And for the most part, you know, it's all about voting today and making a plan for tomorrow and so forth. So again, you know, some of the critics about, you know, her inability to, to have a message votes, you know, well, you know, in the sense so could we use this Twitter data points to explain primary source or electoral events at the state or local level? So during the elections, you know, uh, during the primary season uh, before COVID, I was trying to understand this and I was supposed to uh, get a bunch of students to work with me during the summer on this question, but we had to put a hold on the research uh, because of the Corona uh, crisis. And it's unfortunate because, you know, um, that would have been a really awesome thing. So a lot of this work I was going to do during the summer uh, with uh, three or four uh, students, and we were going to really delve into the data. But I didn't run numbers, you know, um, and for the most part, what we can see is that, no, um, the, the numbers, you know, the approach that we have used are not very strong at really, you know, um, explaining the results of the primaries or other electoral events at the state level. And it may be, and, I, and again, I'm st we're still, I'm still de de debating this and deciding this. And hopefully next summer I'll have more to say because I'll have the, re the, the teams of researchers work with me on this question, is that, you know, um, is that events you know, at the national level have a lot more people and it basically, you know, gets more people involved in the process than when you have an election in Iowa or a primary in South Carolina. And th this approach, you know, has not been very good at predicting you know, who could actually win the election. I, the only primary where, where this actually showed to be the case was Nevada, but in South Carolina, Biden won by a lot. Um, if we went to look at his tweets, 
uh, it actually would not have predicted his victory. And the same place with Buttigieg uh, performance in Iowa. So, but social media may help us do other things. And I'm gonna go through this a little bit quicker so I can get to, to the third case study, which is mostly about Biden versus Trump. And, but, uh, but we've been playing, and I, I guess I've been playing, but again, this was something I think my students and I were gonna be looking into. And we did, you know, before COVID, you know, send us back in home. I have been meeting with him in February and in March to actually start talking about this. And we started to see some interesting uh, trends and I'm gonna share some of them with you, but they're not final. They're just basically right now uh, a work in progress. So, so debates matter and, you know, Mike Bloomberg knows better than anybody. M uh, Mrs. Warren, of course, Senator Warren, uh, made sure in the Nevada debate, you know, that, that Bloomberg's candidacy was gonna be over and she basically torpedoed that one uh, quite effectively. But for the most part, it's important that we don't exaggerate the effects of a debate. Um, we in, in the political science realm believe that they do help voters pay closer attention to the campaign. They help voters learn about candidates' policy positions. They help voters differentiate between candidates' views, which is very important. And they can also decide, you know, uh, help voters decide who to vote for especially, you know, uh, as, as you draw closer to the election. So I believe that debates are important, but it's important that we sometimes, you know, tend to exaggerate a little bit the, their, their strength. So given the stakes, you know, um, uh, the presidential debates are more consequential than the debates held, you know, held during the, the primaries and that should not be a surprise. So I'm using this, you know, uh, study to look at you know, uh, at the, at, to, to basically analyze the upcoming um, debates between um, Biden and Trump, and of course, uh, between Harris and, and Pence. But, you know, measuring, you know, who won a debate is very subjective. If you follow the media, uh, you know that the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and BuzzFeed and Vox and 538, they all have a panel of experts that are basically trying to rate who won the debate and every single person has their own pick for different reasons. So it's actually, you know, uh, very difficult to actually judge this. Donald Trump, you know, was famous for sharing the results of scientific polls in social media accounts after his participation debates, both in the primary and the general election. And that of course, you know, put some people over the top, especially Nate Silver at 538. Um, so you have seen over the years, some networks and polling firms conduct polls or focus groups to help them understand who won a debate and why. And while this is, I think the best option it is costly, explaining why we have very few polls, you know, that actually measure uh, candidates, you know, performance in debates. So uh, 538 earlier in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cycle with the primaries, partnered with the polling firm Ipsos to actually try to measure scientifically uh, the candidates, you know, the Democratic candidates' performance in their primary debates. Uh, what they did was to recruit a panel of primary voters uh, who were asked to complete a questionnaire before and after the debate. So the idea was that they had a couple of simple questions that they would go uh, do so online and they would actually do so before the, the debate started and then afterwards. And then you could measure changes in attitude. Uh, the survey, you know, asked respondents uh, to rate the candidate's performance to explain whether the candidate's performance would change their body preference, rate their favorability scores, and voters also were asked who they thought could best beat Donald Trump. And of course, this last one is important given that many, many Democrats uh, do not really care so much who's gonna win as long as that person was gonna beat Trump. Um, is there an easier and cheaper way to measure, uh, it should be, an, opinions of the candidates' performance. And, you know, this is where I come in, you know? So can a change in candidates' numbers of social media followers help us determine who won the debate? The answer is maybe. And so let me just walk you through what I do. And I'll do this kind of quickly, you know? So I took the numbers from 538 uh, and Ipsos and then created a score. So these are basically the different variables or factors that were being measured by um, by, by, by 530 and Ipsos. And I added those scores to create a score that would actually tell us, you know, who won or who lost. And then I've been collecting uh, the followers on social media on a 
daily basis now for three years. And so I have a ton of data. I don't have this unfortunate for the 2016 and it's very difficult to get that data now. Um, and we can talk about that in the, in the question and answer. But for the most part, you know, I have a ton of data on who has, you know, uh, on how many people join the thing. So what I did is I asked, uh, I basically collected data the hours before the, the debate and then 12 hours before and the day after basically of the debate and to see, you know, who actually gained the most followers. And then I could actually say that it was partially because of, you know, of, of, of the debate. And basically, you know, we have a percentage. So 1.71% uh, means that out of the no total numbers of people that follow the, the candidate, the day after the debate, 1.71 can be attributed for the hours that took place between the, the start of the debate and the time that I collected the, the data. And like I said, I would collect the data in the morning, usually around between nine and 10 o'clock when, when I got to the office, you know, um, for, for work. So I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but for the most part, you know, the, the data, you know, suggests that the measure works, you know, so in the Atlanta debate, you know, uh, we see that uh, Steyer, you know, got, got a lot of, got more traction than, than the rest. In the Ipsos, uh, Buttigieg wins the debate according to, to, to their panel. And for the most part, he gets, you know, a, bo a boost in his numbers. Again, Steyer did better overall, but the difference between Steyer and Buttigieg is that Steyer, you know, picked up less people uh, overall than Buttigieg because Buttigieg following was a lot bigger than, than Steyer. Putting everything in percentages allows us to compare apples to apples, but there has to be a way, and this is basically something that I've been thinking about that, is to actually weigh uh, the number of followers based on the numbers of existing followers. So somebody like you know, like like Steyer, you know, would not have such a big jump as the other ones. Yang also did very well here, and but Yang's numbers were stronger than than than, than Steyer's because his following is actually was a, a, a lot healthier. So this is where, where I have been playing with the numbers and I have not been able to figure out how to do this. So if anybody out there has, uh, has any suggestions, I'm, I'm all ears. In the LA debate, the same thing, Klobuchar is the winner. For the most part, you know, she does extremely well in terms of follower, but notice that, you know, Yang starts eclipsing her and, and that's an important measure altogether. And it, it's important to mention that I've been looking at social media followers in Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram. I'm not looking at, at, at other social media sites. Um, so if you look at the Des Moines debate, which was the famous Iowa debate, Klobuchar uh, actually wins it according to, to the panel. Uh, she picks up a lot, but Sayer is the one that is speaking the most. Buttigieg, the same thing. Um, here, you know, but Klobuchar, you know, gets more of the percentage. And this was a famous New Hampshire debate where most people in the media believed that she had convincingly won the night, but the panel did not necessarily agree with the pundits that day. So, but, you know, in this sense, you know, uh, Klobuchar wins, you know, if you were to look at the data from, from other, other places, but I'm trying to use the, the polling data as, as, a, as a measure right here. In the Charleston debate, you know, again, it's the same, the same pattern. Um, that we see before. Uh, Steyer, of course, you know, picks up quite a bit. He did really well, actually, in this debate. Uh, many people, you know, uh, gave him a second look because of that. And even though he would not win, of course, you know, uh, he definitely put a lot of eggs into his um, basket in, in, in South Carolina. Uh, Klobuchar and Buttigieg also did well. Uh, and, and Bloomberg, you know, um, did, you know, okay, but not, didn't get too many, too, too many people be out of that one. Um, I think what's important to start noticing in, in all this, you know, uh, debates is that, you know, Biden doesn't do really well in terms of his performance and his numbers, you know, in social media are not really strong uh, either. Where that is different is in the last one. And it's basically, you know, um, an important thing to highlight that when you have two candidates, right, and multiple, the, the, the approach that I'm trying to use tends to be uh, stronger. And this is the question that my students had for me is that maybe, you know, the problem here is that um, we have too many candidates with multiple, you know, levels of favorability and, 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 and public visibility. 
and that it may not be captured easily by the by 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 social media. Bernie Sanders, for instance, had a lot of followers already, so he was not going to pick up as much as a person who has less visibility than him, a person like Tom Steyer or or Yang, uh, or Klobuchar or Buttigieg. So that's one problem that you have right here. But when you start noticing, uh, comparing Biden to 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 um, to Sanders, which are two politicians that are really well known and have very strong social media followings, then this, this things will change. So I think, and, and I think, you know, one of my students would agree with me because we were going back and forth in March of this year with this debate, is whether, you know, whether this approach is better suited for explaining smaller debates with smaller number of candidates, or at least, you know, when you have two people, you know, going forward. I don't know the answer to that, but I will know uh, in a couple of weeks. And if you need to know the answer, um, you can try to contact me and I'll tell you what I think. Third case study, and I'm going to uh, go through this, you know, uh, we have 754, so I want to have, be, I'm mindful of the time and I want to have some time to address some of your possible questions. Uh, what I want to try to, this is the newest one, and I put this one together uh, in the last couple of days. Um, if you have been reading the media, uh, you probably have noticed that there's a lot of people that are concerned that Trump's, you know, law and order campaign following the, the Republican National Convention is actually working. And there's a lot of uh, Democratic um, strategists, a lot of Democratic leaders uh, who are concerned that, that Joe Biden is not doing enough to counter Trump's take. Here is basically where we stand today in terms of followings. President Trump uh, has a very strong following in social media. I think some people will be surprised to see his numbers in Instagram because Instagram tends to be for younger people or a lot of their, their users are younger than, 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 than the average age. Um, Twitter, of course, is basically his mega bullhorn and he tends to write his own tweets and he tends to retweet his own things. Um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Mm, Facebook, you know, uh, has grown, but it's not grown as quickly as you know as 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 twitter as you will see in a second you know uh right now the pew research center estimates that almost 20 percent of american adults follow the president in twitter and that's insane so you don't expect trump to give up his megaphone because it actually works for him but going back to uh to 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 the case study and to the background information I think, you know, um, in the midst of the, of the convention, I think it was in the second night, or it was in the first night, I'm not sure if it was in the, in the first or second. I don't remember right now the, 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 the dates anymore. I think it was in the second one, but anyhow. Um, Jacob Blake was shot by, by an, a white police officer in, 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 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, the protests, you know, uh, took place shortly after the news spread about the shooting. The process, of course, turned violent. A small detention of the National Guard entered Kenosha to help local, local enforcement, you know, uh, keep control over the situation. Uh, on August 25th, Kyle Rittenhouse, a 17-year-old white supporter of Blue Lives Matter from Illinois, um, shot protesters, killing two and injuring one. The incident brought national attention to the protests, forcing the Biden and Trump campaign to address these events. On September 1, 2020, after promising to do more to reestablish law and order um, in America's urban centers, Trump visited Kenosha to thank the National Guard as well as local and federal law enforcement for bringing order to the city. Two days later, Biden visits the city, meeting with the Blake family and holding a community meeting on the need for racial reconciliation. The situation in Kenosha echoes prior incidents in Minneapolis following George Floyd's murder and the anti-police protests in Portland, Oregon. It was noting that since uh, that since the protests that engulfed Minneapolis after Floyd's death, more than 1,900 protests have been organized, and very very few have descended into violence. And the death count associated with this protest starts at 12, which is a very very small number given the number of Americans that have participated in, in, in these demonstrations. And I really want to emphasize here that that um, that uh, that the rhetoric being used, you know, uh, by supporters of the president are not always in line with the data 
that is collected by uh, law enforcement personnel. Things, of course, the protests are real. Uh, there has been violence, of course, in many of these protests, but it's not as, as badly as, 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 as it has been painted often by, um, you know, uh, conservative media. So why is Kenosha important, you know? Well, I mean, the campaign, the Trump campaign has been searching for an issue and law and order seems to be that issue right now. It was one of the things in the GOP convention. And now we know that Trump has decided to double down on, on, on that uh, issue for now at least. And there is some evidence to suggest that, that, that the message is straight, uh, you know, getting traction with his supporters and that it may be actually uh, convincing some people that voted for Trump in 2016, who may have become the, the solution by his actions to give him a second, second look. And that's of course important, especially in the Midwest. The Biden campaign, of course, you know, has been very supportive of, of, of the protest for racial justice and have criticized strongly people who have rioted and looted. But Biden and, and Harris have not embrace all of Black Lives Matter's demands. So Biden, for example, does not support calls for defunding the police. Does the campaign in an effort to turn the election into a referendum on Trump has decided to focus on the president's failed response to COVID-19. And in some ways, the Biden camp understands that questions regarding law and order is a divisive issue that can fracture his coalition. So in the last weeks, commentators in major publications, like I mentioned before, have been noting that Law and order may be the message that can, can help Trump convince Americans, especially white suburban women, to give Trump a second look. Many Democratic officials, you know, have asked Biden to respond to Trump's message and explain why Biden added Kenosha to the travel schedule. And we could add that also, you know, why Harris was in Wisconsin uh, recently uh, to talk to, to supporters there. So I'm just using this, you know, to, to, to set the, the, the background here. So the puzzle that I have for you guys and, and that I have for myself as well is that why did Trump decide to focus on law and order? Is a message resonating with his supporters? Can it sway undecided voters or 2016 Trump supporters who are currently favoring Biden? Is Trump's message distracting the Biden campaign from its focus on the COVID-19 crisis and the Trump administration poor handling of the challenge? We could add also, you know, has the media, you know, really, you know, uh, move away from, from, from other issues and concentrate in, on law and order? as the president would prefer. And of course, the last question is, can Twitter data help us answer these questions? And here, of course, you know, I say yes, of course, you know, because um, I'm biased to this area. Although as you, you saw in my presentation, I don't embrace social media for the sake of embracing social media. We are still figuring out how to use it properly under what circumstances it helps us and in what circumstances it doesn't. So I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent, but I am not necessarily, you know, completely convinced that it's a, sometimes the best way forward. Um, if you look at the number of daily tweets for Biden and Trump, notice that Trump is definitely ahead, but that, you know, Mr. Biden is actually doing pretty good uh, compared to Hillary Clinton's tweets. You know, uh, there is definitely, you know, a, a bigger give and take, and there is definitely a lot of engagement from the Biden campaign in Twitter. So it's not only Trump doing what Trump does best, which is to tweet Biden and his team have been doing so as well. And in the case of Biden, it is clear that this is being um, curated by the campaign and that the Biden, Biden is not writing them himself. If you were to look at the average favorites for Trump's and Biden's tweets and the same for, for the retweets, notice that these graphs are very, very different from the ones that we saw with Clinton and Trump in 2016. Trump was, of course, you know, ahead of the game in both sides of the equation, but here we have a lot of variability. Yes, Trump does extremely well, but there's many days where, where, where Biden actually does win over Trump. And some of these peaks right here tend to be the ones that deal with COVID. Many people are not happy, including in the president's own Republican base with the administration's handling of the COVID crisis. So, and one thing that it doesn't, does, it's not apparent in this graph, but if you were to actually run a trend line for the numbers for Trump under the favorites, he is actually losing some, you know, um, uh, the number of favorites has declined over time. And that should be concerning for the administration because in the end, Trump's megaphone is, you know, indication of, of what people, how people, you know, and, and, and you know, people's reaction to, to the tweets, you know, 
can 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 be uh, a source of, of information for them going forward. Okay, so I downloaded all of Trump's tweets from 2020, and I used and I and I and I and I just you know went for 2020. So Jan first to September third, I had to end in September third because I needed to run the numbers this weekend. And basically, I created what we call bigrams. Basically, we take the text and clean it from all what we call subwords, you know, prepositions and, and the such, words that don't have any meaning. And then I told the computer program, okay, take out all those words that have no meaning and leave me behind, you know, with, with, with key phrases made of two words, a bigram. And you can do this with trigrams, but it's not as, as, as accurate as bigrams. So in the bigrams, we start noticing that, that in 2020, overall, we saw the tweets, that the, the bigram that has the most, you know, attention is fake news. Then there's total endorsement, which is um, a reference to the president's endorsement of uh, people in the in the primaries. Then we have radical left, White House, Sleepy Joe, Joe Biden, Republican Party, Mini Mike, federal government, mainstream media, impeachment hoax, National Guard, military bets, President Trump, approval rating, news conference, news media, Supreme Court, Russia, Russia, PM Eastern, which is basically saying I'm going to be in a news conference. Uh, New CNN, which of course is not never supported, November third, which is election day, and of course Grace, Crazy Nancy, which is a reference to Nancy Pelosi. If we go into the the bygrounds from the twenty fourth, which is the the start of the of the Republican National Convention, to nor, uh, last Thursday, then we can see that fake news is still in the top, but not as high. That the National Guard tweets have actually gone up a little bit. That radical left is still pretty healthy. Federal government, then Joe Biden comes in twice because one has Joe Biden and then the other one has a new tagline, which is Joe Hyden, a reference that the, the, the vice president campaigns from his basement. Anarchists and ag agitators start to make it up. Beauty parlor, which is a reference to Nancy Pelosi's decision to get her hair done in a, in a, in a, in a beauty parlor in San Francisco. Uh, law enforcement, Kenosha, Wisconsin, National Convention, Crazy Nancy, days ago, Dem Democrat run, low energy, Nancy Pelosi, parlor owner, China virus, God bless, um, you know, Hurricane Laura, local authorities, mini strokes, November 3rd, and the mini strokes is a storyline that supposedly had a, a bunch of strokes earlier this year, and then the run cities. Okay, so, and run cities is, a, is basically a criticism that they're democratic run cities, and they're basically a fall with violence and so forth. If we actually were to take those things and then we tell the computer program, okay, take all those tweets for 2020 and then tell me how they're doing in terms of, you know, their, their retweet. And what we do is like in this graph, let me try to explain it. Zero represents the average retweet for all tweets, you know, done uh, during the time period. And zero, you know, uh, so so that retweet is nineteen, uh, you know, nineteen thousand plus retweets, and you will see that, of course, his tweets with impeachment don't get too much love. Then once we see economy, the virus, Clinton, border, and vaccine, don't do very well. The other ones like trade, jobs, and immigration, which were important um, topics for the twenty sixteen election do okay, they're within the average. The ones that reference Joe Biden, Joe, uh, are there. The ones of the Dow are better. Fake, of course, or fake news, better too. But notice that now we start with Portland. Obama, which is always, of course, you know, a useful, you know, um, topic for the president because, you know, uh, that really gets his, energizes his base. The National Guard, Kenosha, police, Minneapolis, Antifa, which is supposedly the domestic terrorism that are behind a lot of those protests and then Biden in the end. If you start noticing here, you start noticing that the president has to, you know, play to his strength and that some of the topics that got him into the water in 2016 and then animated his base for most of his presidency are not really working. And the biggest problem, of course, is, you know, the, the, the COVID crisis, which also has created some economic headaches for the president. If we were to look at the favorites, and again, that's another measure that we have, we start seeing the same pattern. 
Notice that, you know, the impeachment and the virus, you know, do actually, you know, get the president down. The vaccine is looking a little bit better here because people have hopes that we can get a vaccine sooner than later. But if, let's concentrate on the, on the ones in the bottom. Antifa, Minneapolis, police, Kenosha, National Guard, Portland. They're all basically, you know, um, different words that play strong to his law enforcement message. And the president, you know, you can notice it's not completely being irrational. Going into the law enforcement, you know, route is something that he has to do because it benefits, uh, you know, his, you know, his campaign and it actually energizes his base. The question is, can he expand the base? So, of course, you know, as mentioned before, people are complaining uh, within the Democratic camp that Biden has to do more to um, balance or to try to take on the president's um, abuse on law and order. Uh, if we look at the top backgrounds for Biden, uh, for the, you know, for, for the July to September period, I'm not including all the tweets for 2020, because Biden, of course, was in campaign mode uh, for the primaries until, until June. June is when he secures it, but I, I decided to use July 1st as a cutoff. Uh, that was an arbitrary um, cutoff for me. Um, and you start noticing that most of his, you know, biograms are connected to Donald Trump and President Trump and the White House and healthcare and the American people and the economic crisis, security, social security, and we can keep on going down the list. What you start noticing here is that there is not too much on race. There is not too much either on law enforcement and there's not too much, you know, mentions of uh, Minneapolis, Kenosha and so forth. Donald Trump, you know, uh, when you start seeing the, the tweets after the RNC, which is basically when um, the Biden, you know, starts, you know, and I put the RNC for compar comparison perspective, we should have probably added some of the Democratic National Convention, but but I, this is for, for comparison perspective. I, I kept it at 824 to 993. Uh, it really doesn't seem too much to be much change. Uh, the American economy has gone up. You have now mentions of John Lewis. You have, I've mentioned to El Paso, which is connected to the anniversary of the shootings that took place last year um, in, in Texas. And, you know, but for the most part, the, the messaging has not changed whatsoever. The Biden campaign, it's, it's a very, uh, so far has proven to be very uh, traditional and they had to be seen to be on message. And they believe that uh, making this into a referendum of the, of the Trump campaign will work. And that is one of the reasons that they have put so much emphasis on, you know, on, on this issue. So it's Trump strategy working. And, you know, I downloaded over a, a million tweets, um, you know, connected to Kenosha. Over 230,000 were unique tweets and an estimated 22 mentioned real Donald Trump directly. And once I classified those tweets, you know, many people, you know, felt that Trump's visit to Kenosha was a photo op, was a photo opportunity. Uh, but at the same time, many people seem to also be supportive of his views or agreeing that, you know, that, that American cities, especially those that are controlled by Democrats, you know, are out of control. Uh, the newest CBS News Yuga poll, uh, which was published this weekend, um, well, actually it was published for, I think, Mon well, no, it's, uh, it was a Sunday, I think it was, does include a serious question to demonstrate that Trump's law and order message is resonating with many white Americans, independents, and even some Latinos. But the same poll also shows that many Americans are critical of Trump's handling of the COVID crisis, echoing many of Biden's attacks. So as I start to wrap up, you know, today's, you know, presentation, uh, I will say, you know, a couple of things, you know. So uh, as I mentioned before, the Pew Research Center estimates that 20% of Americans follow President Trump's Twitter account. So there's one reason to pay, to pay attention to social media. Social media, of course, you know, is um, it's just, especially his Twitter feed, it's a way that we can mine it to understand how he views the world and his understanding of the world. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that other countries around the world are doing, are basically looking at his social media to try to figure this out. While Trump's, you know, following social media is bigger than Joe Biden's, I think it's important that we emphasize that that polling engagement with the vice president's tweets are actually quite strong and better than Hillary Clinton's numbers. So for those of you who are Democrats, don't feel too disparaged about, you know, about that. For those of you who are Republicans, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, the president, you know, is a very convincing, you know, uh, messenger in his own media, uh, in, in Twitter. So 
analysis social media posts is not an alternative to public opinion research, but you know, it is definitely, you know, um, it is definitely something that we should do together. So it's important that to keep that in mind. I don't think one should substitute the other, both of them together can, can help us, you know, understand questions. And yeah, and I'm gonna leave it at that, you know, um, and we'll go from there. So if you have any questions, please type them in um, and I'll try to do my best to answer them. Um, thank you. <laughs>